dreaming of a light Christmas. Are you with me here, church? Yes. Now, one of the most exciting things when you study the Bible is to see all the messianic prophecies come true. First of all, in the first century, but now in the 21st century. And perhaps the greatest collection of messianic prophecies come from Isaiah chapter 7 through Isaiah chapter 11. So let's start right there in Isaiah. All right, come on, honey. Perhaps the most famous of all is Isaiah 7 in verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Amen, guys? Amen. This was written at 750 B.C. and, of course, comes true right there at the birth of Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 9, in a well-known scripture, we read in verse 1, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles, by the way of the sea, among the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. You know, throughout Scripture, the concept of light is always associated with with God. And right here he's talking about that there was a period literally of, of centuries before the great light of Jesus would dawn. As a matter of fact, this scripture right here is used at the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Matthew chapter 4. You know, this past week, uh, Elaine and I live in Marina del Rey, and in our little section of Marina del Rey, we had at 4 o'clock in the morning, we find this weird sound go off on Elena's cell phone. And I go, what, what was that? You know, I woke on up right there. And, and, of course, we figured it out. The power went out. So that was 4 in the morning and no power. Well, that didn't bother me too much because we get up about 536. So get up at 6, no power. That means no lights and no coffee. Now, it's getting serious. At 7 o'clock, no power. And I had an appointment. And we live in a place where the, the, our, our cars are all gated in. And they, they were, it's electronic gate. And we were trapped. No power, no car. 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 12. I mean, this was disastrous. Finally, by 4 o'clock, we get home, and the lights had come on. And we said, amen. See, that was about 10 hours of darkness. And we got all fired up that the light comes on. Because with that comes coffee and the car. <laughs> Can you imagine 10 centuries of darkness between the time of the reign of David and the birth of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. And so this analogy right here, the people have been walking in darkness, have seen a great light, that is Jesus. If it's exciting after 10 hours, think about how exciting light can be after 10 centuries of darkness. Later on is the famous scripture in verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there'll be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. He says the zeal of God will bring the Messiah. Let's go to some of the more familiar passages now in the New Testament. Let's go to Luke chapter 2. And let's see the light that has dawned. A light has dawned. That's our first point. In verse 1, in those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. Now, right here, we see the zeal of the Lord Almighty. 
We see the sovereignty of God. It was God that allowed there to be a Roman Empire, and particularly Caesar Augustus, who brought forth what was called in that day the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, which eventually would allow Christianity to spread throughout the entire Roman world. Secondly, it was through the emperor that there was issued a census. Now, what are the chances a census is going to be issued at just the right time? What did the census do? If you read on, you'll find that Joseph is living in Nazareth, which is way north in Israel. But because of the census, you had to go to your hometown. He goes to his hometown of Bethlehem right at the time that Mary would give birth. That's not by chance, that's by God. The sovereignty of God was literally bringing into his control the nations to bring forth the light of Jesus Christ. Jesus is born, of course, in Bethlehem. And we read in verse 8. And there were shepherds living there out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom a Savior rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord had told us about. You see, the Lord turned the lights on after 10 centuries, and it got the shepherds' attention. I don't know whether you've ever been away from the city and out into the desert area, but you look up at night, and it is just magnificent when you see the stars. And there's a sense of darkness that makes the stars sparkle. Can you imagine being a shepherd out in just such a a night and then all of a sudden this one angel comes with such glowing light that he pronounces a savior has been born and then the Bible says the heavenly host come. That's a whole bunch more angels. The lights get turned on after 10 centuries and the shepherds are so fired up to see the power source. And so they head to Bethlehem to see the baby Jesus. Now, very interestingly, Luke is written with a Gentile audience in mind. But the book of Matthew is written with a Jewish audience in mind. Turn to Matthew chapter 2. A light is dawn. Verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. I mean, Jesus has been disturbing people for centuries. Even as a little baby, he's disturbing people. It's disturbing to think that God brought forth the Messiah through a virgin. In order to give birth to a whole kingdom of people who are devoted to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, it's particularly disturbing to King Herod. You see, King Herod was not in a lineage of kings. He was appointed by the Romans. And so he was, so to speak, a usurper to the throne. And so when he hears this message, hey, there's a, there's a king that's born here in Judea. He gets freaked out of his mind. Because he thinks, oh no, someone's going to take my throne from me. And of course, you know, Herod gives birth to a whole lineage of, of Herods that we know well. Herod the Great, we read later on in chapter 2, is the one that kills all the babies in Bethlehem. Because he's trying to kill Jesus. His son, Herod Antipas, is the one that kills John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 14. His grandson, Herod Agrippa, is the one that kills the apostle James in Acts chapter 12. And his great-grandson is Agrippa II, who lives with his sister Bernice, and of course is the one that gives audience to Paul in Acts 26. Now that's quite a family, Amigos. But I think the thing that I find very interesting right here, it says Magi. Now of course we usually call them the wise men. Fair enough. But actually Magi is probably a a better term for them. These people come out of, most likely, Persia. They're 
so to speak, Genesis is during the time of Nebuchadnezzar and Darius, as well as Cyrus, who we read about, you know, in the scriptures. And these men are part priests, part scholars, part astrologers. And the Persian people were very mystical people. But a lot of their mysticism, believe it or not, came from the Jews that dispersed. You remember the Jews got dispersed into Assyria? And then they got dispersed into Babylon? Well, believe it or not, a lot of their teachings and prophecies filter into the people. And so, at this particular time, it was well known throughout Persia and Arabia and all of that world that there was going to be a very special king born in Israel. That was the rumor. And so, when these magi saw the star, and of course, we with our advanced technical expertise understand it probably was a comet. Amen. <laughs> but I can't tell the difference between a star and a comet looking down from here, so amen. <laughs> they see it and they go, wow! This must be it! And they literally follow that star. Now they get all the way to Israel and they stop by King Herod's place. And it was disturbing everybody. It didn't just disturb King Herod. It was disturbing to all of Jerusalem. We read in verse 4. When he would called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied. You got to understand, these are Gentiles telling the Jews what the scriptures say. You know, it's not unlike our generation now. We live really in a scripturally ignorant time. There are a lot of people in America that claim to be Christians, but I mean, a good test is, can you even name the books of the Bible in order? Let alone what's inside of the books. And so here we have Gentiles telling the Jews what the scriptures say. Scary, huh? Wow. Verse 5, in Bethlehem of Judea they replied, For this is written by the prophets, but you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared, assuming, and probably rightfully so, that that was the time that Jesus was born. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. Now that's a bunch of gunk. <laughs> After they'd heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they'd seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold and incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now it's kind of interesting as we break this down. We've always been told about the story of the three wise men. And in actuality, there is no number right here. The only reason people have ever assumed there are three wise men is there are three gifts. Okay? That's why. It could have been two, could have been four, could have been a bunch of guys who got together in Persia wanted to go see the Lord. Amen? I don't know. <laughs> Secondly, we see right here that the Lord has conveniently timed this so that Joseph is not there. Only Mary is with the Christ, is with Jesus. And Mary is not adored or worshipped. Jesus is. There are some very basic things that, that Matthew was trying to communicate right here. That the king of the Jews was Jesus. He was to be worshipped and would be worshipped not only by the Jews, but by the nations around. They would come in adoration. Interestingly enough, the gifts that they brought were not by chance. You know, like right now we're all scurrying around trying to get gifts. And we're going... I don't care, I just got to get something. That wasn't their thought. Their gifts had a great deal of thought to it. First of all, there was gold. Well, that showed that these guys were pretty rich. But also showed honor to Jesus and his kingly office, a gold. Secondly, we, in most traditional translations, have frankincense, but... The Near National Version just uses incense, but they're pretty much interchangeable in the Greek. And so most likely it was frankincense. This was a very rare ointment that was made from a tree in India. Talk about rare. Amen, guys? And so this signified the divinity of Christ, his priestly office. 
And then thirdly was Muir. That was a perfume used a lot of times in burial, thus associated with suffering and the passion to show Jesus' prophetic office. These men fully understood the gifts they were giving and the honor that they were bestowing upon this, the king of the Jews, who was to be worshipped by all the nations. Now here's the practical part about it all. We know from this passage that, that Herod wants to kill Jesus, right? We also know how poor Joseph and Mary were. And so God tells them in the next passage, you need to flee to Egypt. And so how would they be able to afford fleeing to Egypt? Well, they now have gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They got a lot of money and they can go to a lot of places. Amen, guys? You see, God in his sovereignty is so amazing. Amen, guys? A light has dawned. You know, we're all attracted to the light. We're all attracted. You know, one of the things I find fascinating is what's been happening in our fellowship. I'm, I'm really so moved today about Bill and Dave placing membership all the way from Antelope Valley. Amen, guys? I mean, these guys are going to have to drive an hour and a half to come to services. They say, I don't care how much the gas costs. I don't care how much time costs. I know there's something special happening down there in Montebello in the City of Angels Church, and I want to be a part of it. You know, I think about the Pierces up in Bakersfield. They've got two hours to come on down. I think about the folks like the Friendsleys out there in Palm Springs. I mean, that is the literal desert out there. Amen, guys? <laughs> And then I appreciate so much the brothers and sisters coming down from San Diego like Jeff Ranga's daughter, Victoria. And then especially Jose Moreno, who's coming all the way from Tijuana, Mexico. Why, why come? Why come all the way? Because he sees the lights. It's not a matter how much the gas costs. It's not a matter of trying to find the closest corner church. It's not trying to find a place with the best choir and the music happening thing. They want to come to a place where Jesus is worshipped. And the call to follow him is expected, not only from the pulpit, but by every single member. And I've got to ask you, what price are you willing to pay to come to the light? These guys followed the star until it stopped. You know, I have to really lift up people that have traveled as far as anybody to become members right here. And that's Michael and Sharon Kirshner. Now, very interestingly, uh, a couple of years ago, they heard about the new discipling movement in a very negative way. But you know, it kind of perked their interest, and so they got on the internet, checked some things on out. Then they travel down to Phoenix at the new church down there, feeling, well, it's not exactly City of Angels or Portland, but we'll check it on out. And then they finally came to Portland, and then they, they made a huge decision. As some of you know, Michael worked very hard uh, in, uh, in the world to get the job that he had. He was one of the vice presidents of General Mills. That's a cranking job. Yeah. And uh, about a year ago, the HR department sat down with Michael trying to nail him so he would stay there. He says, by, by the time you're 55, Michael, if you stay here with all the benefits, you are going to be worth about $50 million. How's your job paying? <laughs> well, you know, they had to make a decision. When they saw the star, they, when they saw the light, that a new light had dawned, they said, we got to make this. Do we stay in this lukewarm fellowship? Or do we step out and become a part of things? Of course, the first thing is, bro, you got to start a new church here in Minneapolis soon. <laughs> See, everybody wants their Christianity convenient. You know what I'm talking about? I'd like to have a cranking church right around the corner. <laughs> I said, no, there are no plans right now. Someday we'll be there. I said, you need to come here. Well, you know, for them to come here, 
meant that he had to resign the vice presidency. How about it? Are you willing to leave $50 million on the table? And when he came here, guys, he came here jobless. Jobless. And last few months, he's been looking for a job, praying for a job. And you know, Friday, he got a job. Oh, man. As the Lord would have it, this is not just any job. He's going to be working for one of the top video game companies, Activision. You know, they do Guitar Hero and everything, you know. Some of you guys know too much about that. I told him, I said, you're going to be the most popular guy in the teen ministry. And maybe in the campus ministry, I don't know. But the thing is, is that he he got a package that was fairly comparable to what he had there in Minneapolis. But he had to step out and seek first the Lord. And there are two very basic things you got here. There is no price that you can put on your relationship with God. Money cannot be factored in on whether or not you should seek God. And secondly, the promise of Matthew 6.33 is therefore true. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and everything you need will be given to you. How about it? Are you seeking the star? Are you going after the light, no matter what the price is? How precious is your relationship with God? How precious is it to find a church where people aren't perfect, but they're striving to call each other through discipline, To be disciples of Jesus Christ. Our second point comes from Matthew chapter 5. It's a well known scripture. Yes a great light had dawned and that was Jesus. But Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says this in verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put under a bowl. Instead, they put it on stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Amen. You know, right here, he says that disciples are the light of the world. It's not just Jesus is a great light, but as disciples, we reflect the light of Jesus. I also have to chuckle at this passage. You know, there, there, there are some people today that argue whether or not we should evangelize the world or not. It sure looks like to me, Jesus intended to, right here, that we're to be the light of the whole world and not just a little corner of the United States. He says, just let your light shine there in uh, at Los Angeles. No. He says, let your light shine in the entire world. Yep. That seems to be a command to me. You'll have to wrestle with it yourself. You know, one of the things that I, that I find exciting is to see the Lord bringing people through other people. Come on. See, God is sovereign. God had Caesar come, and there's Pax Romana. He put upon Caesar's heart to have a census, and that got Joseph from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. So Jesus could be born in the right place at the right time, so all the scriptures be fulfilled. He brings the Magi all the way from Persia so that there'd be enough money for them to flee for their lives down to Egypt. See, God's in control. And so we understand that people come to Christ not by accident, but by the very sovereignty and plan of God. That God, as it says in Acts chapter 17, appoints the exact places and times that we should live so that men would seek him, reach out for him, and find him. You know, two of the brothers and sisters that that I love so much are are Carlos and Lucy Mejia. And uh, they have become such dear friends uh, to Elena and myself. And one of the things that's been so exciting is just to see the light in their lives. I remember sitting down with Carlos and Lucy probably about five months ago. And though there was some excitement on Carlos's part about what was happening, 
let's just say for Lucy, the lights were out. <laughs> you know, we laugh a little bit at that. And I kid her as my dear sister. But you know something? You can, you can look into people's eyes, guys. And you can see if the lights are on. Spiritually. You, know, you can tell if a disciple's doing lousy. There's, there's a dimness. There's a confusion. And you can see people in the world. There is a darkness. There's a hollowness. There's an emptiness that goes beyond words, even for those that once knew Christ, like Lucy. The exciting thing is, sisters like Elena and others got on in there, loved up on her, but Lucy decided to return to her first love, Jesus Christ. Yes. And, and, and when you return to the light, you become the light. Yeah. Yeah. And so it wasn't by chance, but by God then, that just a few weeks ago, Lucy meets Irma, and through Irma, her husband, Luis. Now, Luis is going to be baptized today. Is that awesome, guys? And I think Irma's not too far behind right there. But it was, it was awesome. She, you know, and it's impressive when you meet a disciple that's light. But sometimes you think they're just kind of a weird person that's fired up about God. But they brought him to one of our house church services, a park service, and they go, Wow! There's a whole bunch of them like that. <laughs> Every, this, this, I've never seen anything like it. A church where everybody, they're not perfect, but where everybody is a light. Wow. And you know what happened? It put into their hearts to study about Jesus and about what it really meant to follow after Jesus. And of course today... Luis is going to be baptized and be your bro. Amen, guys? Yeah. See, it's just not by chance. You know, certainly, here during this Christmas time, we need to be the light of the world. Amen? And, and sometimes at Christmas time, it becomes a little bit more challenging. You know what I mean? The lines, the finances, all those kind of challenges. Well, Lane and I were trying to kind of downsize a little bit. And so uh, we decided what we had to do was kind of make our lives a little bit cheaper. We had been storing our uh, stuff from Portland uh, in this storage place, and it was setting us back about $400 a month, and going, wow. So I, I talked to Sal. I said, Sal, do you think I could just stuff my junk in your garage for free? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, oh, bro. You know, and as family, that's how we think, right? It's all oh, bro. It's fine. Just bring your junk on down. <laughs> and so, now, now Elena was particularly excited to get rid of a $400 bill a month. Yeah. Yeah. And so in her excitement, she called up the moving company and got the biggest cranking truck you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> now, we don't have that much stuff anymore. <laughs> when I saw the truck... I mean, I've never seen such a big truck. And I had to be the one to drive it. So that gave me a little attitude because, you know, I go, wow, this is, this is not, this is to be dangerous. So then we get to the storage place and it was such a cranking big truck, we couldn't even back it in right. And so in order to get from our storage unit, we had to go about 50 yards, bringing all these boxes of books and all this other junk. And, 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 and each moment, I'm, I'm kind of getting a little bit more of an attitude, i got to be honest, towards Elena. <laughs> then this one guy, he's, he's ticked off that our truck is there, so just out of spite, he kind of brings his, uh, I don't know, pulley kind of right in front of me, and I walk, I, can't, I hit it, like this, oh, it hurts. And uh, DJ's right there. He goes, Bro, did that make you angry? <laughs> yes, DJ, that, that made me angry. <laughs> anyway, make a long story short, we get the stuff down to Sal's place. But once more, it was such a giant truck, we had to park it literally on the street. So we had to crank it all the way from the front yard to the backyard, all the way back <laughs> to the garage. Once more, I'm suffering with a little bit more attitude. But, praise God, I was done. And so on the way home, I go, oh yeah, i got to fill this thing on up with gas. Oh, 
It's not gas, it's diesel. So I look at different gas stations on the west side, nobody had diesel. <laughs> this one's the closest diesel. Oh, it's clear over there. Is that the closest? Yeah, it's the closest. So I had Vic Jr. trailing behind me. And uh, so we finally find this one spot, and I pull on in, and it's just kind of all full, and I'm trying to find the diesel pump, and I'm, I'm right there, and, and, and finally something kind of breaks free, and I hadn't noticed this guy that parked right at the back of my truck. And you know, when you're in a monster truck, you know how things turn? Instead of a car that turns like this, it turns kind of over the side like this. And I, I had my window down, and right as I turned at about one mile per hour, I hear this... <laughs> I hear a series of F words coming from the back of my truck. And I'm telling you, this guy was mad as a hornet. I go, out, I go, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I blew it. It's totally my fault. It's totally my fault. It's a new car. It's totally my fault. So finally, then Vic Jr. comes on over. He goes, bro, did that make you mad? I go, yes, brother. That made me very mad. Bro, did you want to say some swear words? <laughs> no, Victor, why? 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 Is that on your mind? Or... <laughs> and so finally, when I saw that the Lord was sitting on me because I had a bad attitude, I go, you know something? I really need to repent because I'm really not being much light of the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. And how easy it is at this time to, particularly if you have a person like mine, to blame other people. Like the people that got you that giant truck. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there's a whole other group of people that would just be so blaming themselves. And neither, neither one is what the Lord wants. You know, we need to be the light of the word in all that we do, even through our frustrating and difficult times. But you know, I think particularly during the Christmas time, we need to be the light of the world with our families. Yeah. You know, one of the people that, that I really love very much here is uh, Victor and Sonia Gonzalez. And, and they've been partners in the gospel now for about four years. Victor came and joined us early on in Portland up there. We were just a scroungy little group. <laughs> he says, okay, we're coming. <laughs> all ten kids. And, and you know what? I, I, I really appreciate the faith of, of, of Victor and Sonia. I mean, they've lived selfless lives, sacrificial lives. There are a few disciples that work as hard. But in the midst of this, they've really worked hard to try to build their family. And of course, you know, we all love Vic Jr. And, you know, he's such a great blessing. And, of course, with Aurora now, they're expecting their first little baby. Amen. Yeah. Have you ever thought that if each kid has ten kids... <laughs> That'd be a hundred grandkids. I'm excited. I'm excited because next week I think Ezekiel's going to be restored. Is that awesome? You know, Thomas, Thomas and Carlos are, are doing quite well. And then just about a month ago, Sonia was restored. And Salute, Miracle of Miracles, was baptized. And you know, I, I, I think what this says to us is that you know, some of us have parents, grandparents, children, uh, brothers and sisters that haven't responded to Christ. And we get down, we get frustrated. But I think what the example of the Gonzales is, is, is you stay true to the Lord. Don't get down, don't get sad, because that takes away the light. And the very thing that people need to see is the light in your life. They need to see that life, even in the midst of difficult times. Because you see, the light shines brightest where it's darkest. So in, in, in the most difficult of times, that's where your light is going to shine the most and impact your family. And so you see, this Christmas, make sure the lights are turned on. Let your light shine. Finally, let's go to Matthew chapter 11. Jesus says in verse 28, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Light has dawned, point one. Light of the world, point two. 
And point three, light is our burden. Light is our burden. You know, right here, Jesus speaks to anybody that's feeling weary or burden. He says, I'll give you rest. He goes on and he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me and I'm gentle and humble heart and you'll find rest for yourself. My yoke is easy, my burden's light. And you're going, the yoke of Jesus. There's a lot of people that look at being totally committed to Jesus Christ and they think that's the most incredible burden. But see, their view is really of a cart that's being pulled by like one ox. But what Jesus talked about is a cart that's pulled by a double yoke where Jesus is yoked on one side and you're yoked on the other. You still have your burden, but Jesus is helping you move it. Is that awesome? See, that's what being yoked to Jesus is all about. You know, I used to think that, you know, if I'd be more financially secure, if things were going better, then well, that's, that's for sure. I'll be happy. I'll never forget... We, my family had the chance to uh, lead a mission team to Manila, Philippines. And i never forget going there the very first time. And in particular, going to the poorest part of Manila, which is called Smoky Mountain. Now, Smoky Mountain literally is the trash heap on the edge of the ocean. Where they keep dumping the trash, dumping the trash, dumping the trash. And their people, 10,000 people, live on this trash heap. And I'm expecting to be the American missionary that's coming, and I'm going to bring good news and fire all these people on up and make them happy. I get there. These people are fired up. They're happy. Their little kids are jumping off in the polluted water so fired up. And I'm going, that, that just doesn't compute. These people are super poor, and they're happy. How can that be? You know, I, I think that, you know, we look at all the gadgets, because, you know, that's what we're a lot buying right now. We got our, our cell phone, we got our iPods, we got our cranking computers. And, you know, think about it, how, how available you are right now. I mean, people can call you from anywhere in the world and burden you some more. I mean, there is no dead space. I mean, this age of convenience is just... Does your phone list feel like that? And then you got to pay money to have these things to make your life so simple. You know, every now and then, you get a reality check. This scripture is a reality check. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. You know, a lot of us are looking forward to Christmas. It's a happy time. We're getting with family. It's going to be all awesome. But for a lot of times, the holidays are the saddest time of the year because of lack of family. A few days ago, I was going through my mail, and I opened this letter on up, written by a young lady. And she starts out, and it goes, Dear Kip and Elena, I am killing myself today. In the past year, my family's lost my father and grandmother, and now they will lose me too. you away. Someone who's so weary, so burdened, so much loss of hope, they don't even want to live anymore. We're trying to take action on that. Also this past week, for me, there was a, a sad death of a musician named Dan Fogelberg. He's 56 years old. Died of prostate cancer. Had some cranking hits. Longer. Leader of the band. But the one that always touched me the most was entitled Same Old Lang Syne. Now, Old Lang Syne is that song that everybody sings right as, at New Year's time when all the balloons come on down. And of course, even the title kind of shows a, a weariness of life. Same Old Lang Syne. And I remember when this, this song came on out, there were certain things going on in my life that I, I looked at this and, 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 I, and I heard it, and, I, and when I heard it, I cried. And I don't know if you've ever cried when a certain song comes on. But even when I heard that Dan Fogelberg had passed away, I got on YouTube, and I, 
listen to the song again and still brought tears. The emotions were that deep. And it's an autobiographical song. And so you just feel the pain, the hurt, and the emptiness. Let me read it to you. Met my old lover in the grocery store. The snow was falling Christmas Eve. I stole behind her in the frozen foods. And I touched her on the sleeve. She didn't recognize the face at first. But then her eyes flew open wide. She went to hug me. And she spilled her purse. And we laughed until we cried. We took her groceries to the checkout stand. The food was totaled up and bagged. We stood there lost in our embarrassment as the conversation dragged. We went to have ourselves a drink or two, but couldn't find an open bar. We brought a six-pack at the liquor store, and we drank it in her car. We drank a toast to innocence. We drank a toast to now, and tried to reach beyond the emptiness, but neither one knew how. She said she married her an architect who kept her warm and safe and dry. She would have liked to have said she loved the man, but she didn't like to lie. I said the years had been a friend to her and that her eyes were still as blue. But in those eyes, I wasn't sure if I saw doubt or gratitude. She said she saw me in the record stores and that I must be doing well. I said the audience was heavenly, but the traveling was hell. We drank a toast to innocence, we drank a toast to now. And we tried to reach beyond the emptiness, but neither one knew how. We drank a toast to innocence, we drank a toast to time. Reliving in our eloquence, Another old Lang Syne. The beer was empty and our tongues were tired and running out of things to say. She gave a kiss to me as I got out and I watched her drive away. Just for a moment, I was back at school and I felt that old familiar pain. As I turned to make my way back home, the snow turned into rain. How many people have empty relationships like this? Or look back at past relationships, thinking, if I could only live that. And therein lies such a deep, hurtful pain that sometimes humans can't even connect and communicate. How many marriages are like that woman's who just live under the same roof? How many people's great joy is in the past? Even the great spiritual joys of the past, there's nothing exciting now. There's nothing exciting to look forward to. There are no dreams. Just emptiness. But Jesus said, light is our burden. And anyone that comes to him, he'll give us rest. He'll give us peace. Let's close out the sermon in the Messianic Promises in Isaiah chapter 11. Remember, we looked at chapter 7, chapter 9, and now we'll look at chapter 11. Talks about Jesus right here in verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a branch will bear fruit. Okay, the stump of Jesse. Jesse is David's dad. And, of course, that's the house of David, and that's talking about Jesus right here. It says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Verse 5, righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. A little child referring back to that scripture in chapter 9. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all of my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You know, right here it talks not only about the light of Jesus, but the light of the kingdom that was to come. And in this kingdom, things would be unnatural. You'd have wolves living with lambs. You'd have leopards lying down with goats. You'd have them with calves and lions and yearlings. And a little child would lead them. He even says right here, this child would stick his hand down into the hole of a cobra. And nothing bad would happen on the holy mountain of the Lord. The holy mountain of the Lord is always associated with the kingdom of God. 
And then it says, for the earth to be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. There it is again. World evangelism. That is the prophecy. You know, in God's kingdom, things are unnatural. We've got white people being best friends with black people. We got Asians being best friends with Latin people. We got young being best friends with old guys. We've got the rich being friends with the poor. We've got UCLA kids friends with USC kids. I mean, it's, it's unnatural. You know, the Lord is blessing us, and that's the power of the kingdom, is that we love those whom we are not like. And when people walk into a room like that, they go, wow, there is nothing like this anywhere in the world. No society, no organization, no government, no set of politics could ever orchestrate something like this, or they would do it. I mean, here we are in the verge of an incredible election with a lot of different dynamic personalities. Each saying, I'm going to fix the United States. I'm going to fix the world. And if you go back about four years ago, people said the same thing. Four years before that. Four years before that. They've always said, politics does not fix the world. Social programs don't fix the world. What's the only thing that can change the world? It's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. You know, in this new discipling movement, it's exciting to see the Lord blessing us with this unnatural love and unity. You know, I'm, I'm very fired up about Jose and Laura going back to Guatemala and starting a new church. Yeah. And, you know, when, when things broke up in our former fellowship, not only was there autonomy in the local congregations... But then what happened in different nations, each nation became very nationalistic. He says, well, I only want a French person leading us here in France. I don't want any English people. I don't want any of these guys. Only French. It became very autonomous and very nationalistic. What's really cool is to be able to see the incredible relationship just formed in a couple weeks here with Victor and Sonia, with Jose and Laura. Now, Victor and Sonia are Mexicans. And sometimes the Guatemalans feel like the Mexicans are all over them and dominate them. But you know the cool thing in the kingdom? The lion lays down with the lamb. Jose and Laura want that kind of relationship and that discipling. Amen, guys? Amen. You know, I'm excited about Tim Kernan being able to reach out to several of the African nations where we have new churches popping up all the time. And it's very exciting. But in the olden days, they didn't want anybody from the West helping them in Africa because all the colonization passed. And now they're going, oh, it's so great to be brothers in the Lord. Amen. And then most excitingly, this past week, we now have a new church in Novo Siberia, Russia, or in that area is called Siberia. We now have a church of sold out disciples. There's that fire you guys on up. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it's, it's kind of unnatural to think that so here we are in America getting fired up about a bunch of Russians that are coming together. <laughs> It's unnatural, but it is of God. And only in the kingdom of God will you find those kinds of relationships. And only when the light shines through love, the love of God and the love of one another, will then the prophecy be fully true. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. See, I don't know about you. I'm dreaming of a light Christmas. <laughs> I'm dreaming of a Christmas where I won't get angry and mad. No. Yeah. Even about someone else that has done something to you. <laughs> I'm dreaming of a, a light Christmas where the light is going to shine to our friends and neighbors and family. I'm dreaming of a light Christmas where my burden's light. It's not about the presents, not about the money, not about any of this. It's about being restored in Jesus Christ. And I hope and pray that you're dreaming of a light Christmas too. Thanks and God bless.